Well, as you can see, this is Jim Lilly Wiley. You can see his name there, so you know he exists. <laughs> and here is. I'm, I must admit that I'm very pleased Jim is coming because I have worked for Blackwells, Wiley, Wiley Blackwells, and um, I'm very familiar with their outsourcing activities of the past. But every year with outsourcing, things change, don't they? And at the moment, Wiley, which is probably the, well, Blackwells actually were the original people who went big into the out, out, uh, offshoring outsourcing type of thing. And it's very interesting to see where you are now. So go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, so yes, as Anthony says, I'm talking the honor of talking on the controversial topic of outsourcing. <clears throat> and uh, opinions are very polarized for people who are very pro, people who are very against. Um, experiences are very mixed. Um, from uh, very successful um, uh, partnerships to complete disasters. Um, and uh, so, as Anthony says, I'm from Wiley. I was a production editor um, in 2010 uh, when journals content management at Wiley really started to scale up their outsourcing operations. Um, and I was involved in, in these, um, and my presentation is basically um, largely based on those experiences, so it's the outsourcing of the uh, production editor role. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I use the clicker, don't I? Um, so the presentation uh, includes a couple of slides on the current status, um, which uh, gives a bit of an idea on how much outsourcing has increased. Um, reasons for outsourcing, so the benefits side, um, common concerns uh, and further pitfalls, um, and then uh, a few sections on avoiding pitfalls. Um, so <clears throat> at Wiley, we did start outsourcing production editor tasks to the typesetter 15 years ago. Um, as Anthony says, uh, Blackwell was sort of offshoring in-house, basically. They, they uh, moved uh, a lot of their work to a Blackwell operation in Singapore, uh, whereas Wiley uh, tended to move to external vendors. Right, okay. Right, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but yeah, it started some time ago, but the pace of change increased in 2010. For us, peaking this year um, in uh, 2014 with uh, a large number of transitions. Um, many Wiley journals, most Wiley journals are now partially or fully outsourced, um, some more successfully than others, um, which is consistent with other companies uh, of a similar size. But having said that, there are uh, examples where. Um, outsourced journals have moved back in-house, so uh, there has been a move the other way as well in some cases. Um, the role of the in-house uh, content management staff, so the production editor, has changed as a result of this to, uh, to more managing more and doing less. Uh, managing the vendors, or as Melissa was talking in the, in the previous uh, talk, uh, undertaking new specialized, specialized roles rather than the processing activities which have been outsourced. Um, correspondingly, uh, the vendor side, the number of staff has uh, increased a lot. Um, the numbers over the blue bars there are the years uh, of first service, first full service at these uh, vendors, um, and then the red bars are this year. Um, and this illustrates uh, the number of staff of journal production editors, books production editors, and journal editorial office support staff at Vendor 1, and then similarly uh, combined for Vendor 2 there. Um, so that's several vendors were um, sort of asked for data on this. These are ones who supplied information, and you can see a big increase there. <coughs> So the benefits, the reasons for outsourcing. Um, as you know, we're, in a, we're a part of an industry that's undergoing rapid changes. Um, a great deal of digital innovation is taking place. 
um, which is the focus of the talks today. Um, also, there are challenges and opportunities in open access to address. Um, so, there's a need to release funds to invest in this digital transformation, um, which most likely involves an element of restructuring. Um, and so, savings are sought from traditionally high-cost areas, specifically production and content management. Uh, obviously by reducing print, uh, but there's a push to maximize uh, cost savings at the, from typesetters as well. Um, and a key way of doing this is moving the production editor task over the typesetter, and so we can realize greater volume discounts from the typesetter. Meanwhile, on the publisher side, um, the publisher is able to reduce overhead costs um, either over, uh, reduce overhead costs or redeploy staff to higher value roles, um, as we've discussed. So um, another benefit is the uh, possibility to realize uh, higher speeds and efficiency by moving work to the vendor. Um, often this is achieved by dividing the tasks into a series of small production tasks, sometimes called salami slicing. But also the uh, production editor is now based where the typesetter is, and so deliverables can bounce backwards and forwards more quickly, and the overall uh, time to publication uh, can be speeded up. Um, usually the uh, partnership with the typesetter also opens up access to specialized expertise, software engineers, uh, or in-house in typeset tools like the uh, copy editing and XML workflow first tool, XML first workflow tools. On the flip side, uh, common concerns, of course, is a loss of control um, at the micromanagement level um, that's going to happen. These common concerns, are, I think, are all valid. Um, but there might be ways of uh, managing them, um, and some of these I'll talk about uh, later on in the presentation. Um, so loss of control, drop in quality, if the vendor isn't um, sort of kept close and uh, um, there isn't uh, support and oversight of the vendor. Um, of course, there's time zone factors. It is possible for the uh, vendor to work on a Europe or a US uh, shift, um, but you don't want that to be an impact. In the next point, which is high staff turnover at the vendors, um, there at Wiley we've had uh, production editors who have uh, been with the company for 30 or 40 years, so we don't expect that to be the case at the vendor. Um, so there is a big contrast there. Um, but it is important to know what uh, measures the vendor takes in terms of um, uh, giving training and promotion opportunities to their staff and, and uh, uh, social activities, um, to, and also the location of the vendor office uh, has an impact on uh, turnover of the staff. Smaller university towns tend to... Uh, help in terms of retaining the staff um, at the, the, the company that's providing the work in that town. Uh, our experience in Wiley is also that where we've had transitions which went really fast uh, and the, we know things were pretty hectic at the vendor, there was immediately quite a high staff turnover in the first year. But we've also had transitions where there was careful recruitment uh, time to train the staff, a lot of face-to-face -face contact with, with Wiley staff, um, and in uh, an example I'm going to show you, uh, we had no, no levers from the vendor in the first year, so that did have a big impact. Um, and then the, the last two points, of course, uh, company failure. Uh, there's a need for senior management to stay close to the, to the vendor. Um, to know the health of the company, the, uh, the size of its client base, the strategy of the parent company, uh, factors like this. 
Um, and exposure to exchange rate fluctuations is also a danger. Um, Chinese yuan has, uh, has a, a pre strengthened, meaning that China is uh, less of a uh, um, desirable uh, vendor location. Um, so ultimately, for these last two points, uh, a, an exit strategy is, is needed in, if it comes to that. So pitfalls, when uh, the decision is taken to go ahead with outsourcing, uh, what, what are the pitfalls? One of the common pitfalls is the idea that content management can be outsourced lock, stock, and barrel. Um, and uh, this guy here is pondering that idea. Meanwhile, the, layers, uh, the chairs on his, uh, the, the legs on his chair are, are cracking from underneath him. So, uh, run through a few points about pitfalls. Um, budgeting for the costs in transitions. Um, we have had uh, costs involved in uh, uh, project managing the transition, training, monitoring, supporting during the transition. And then post-transition, uh, we need capacity to uh, vendor manage on an ongoing basis. And also systems uh, costs. Um, if a uh, direct line is, is uh, established between the uh, vendor and the uh, publisher in order to access publishing systems, like an MPLS line, um, the setup costs and the ongoing costs are very high there. So there are costs involved. Um, Loss of expertise internally. Um, this can be at the journal level, or it can be uh, loss of expertise in specific systems and workflows, um, where if, if in-house content management shrinks too much. Um, on the, at the journal side, it's easy to document the uh, basic workflows of a journal but uh, there are nuances to a journal which are unlikely to be documented. Um, and so in many cases, that, that knowledge and experience will be, will be lost. Um, lack of oversight of the vendor and high pace of transitions. I think I'll talk a bit more on later slides about that. Um, vendor being realistic about capacity uh, is, is quite a common problem because the publisher is always going to ask can you take on these journals next month? A large number of journals, can you take them on next month? Vendor's not going to say no. Uh, they, they generally say, yep, we can do it, even though there's a big challenge for them. Um, they, they, they're going to try and rise to the challenge, but if you've pushed them too far, problems will come up. Salami slicing of tasks, I, I mentioned that under efficiencies, but there's, there's only so much uh, you can do there. Uh, production editor work. Um, can only be salami sliced to a certain point. There are um, uh, some aspects of production editor work which, uh, which need knowledge of the journal um, and are not uh, appropriate for this approach. Um, also, production editor work involves communication, um, customer relations, uh, being proactive and looking out for problems, not suitable for this, this kind of approach. Project creep, uh, even where you have a, an original plan uh, with a, to outsource a distinct portfolio, um, it sometimes is possible that uh, titles or specific tasks are then added to the project, tasks and titles that were not considered appropriate for outsourcing in the first place. Um, so that's a danger. And finally, uh, the negative impact on our staff is a big one. Um, the loss of colleagues uh, in-house can have a huge impact on morale. And so the leadership team needs to invest a lot in terms of re-engaging with staff. So pit those are the pitfalls. Um, and what can be outsourced, uh, I've just listed some journal considerations here which indicate where the risks or impracticalities 
uh, of outsourcing may be too high. Um, but having different workflows uh, is helpful. So um, if a journal is not suitable for full outsourcing, um, have al having alternatives whereby they can be retained in-house or specific tasks can uh, be outsourced under the uh, partial outsourcing workflow. So a few slides on avoiding uh, pitfalls. Uh, probably with, without the nonchalance that this guy's showing here. <laughs> Vendor selection uh, is important. Uh, it usually involves a formal uh, evaluation process following the uh, RFPs supplied by the vendor. And competitive pricing is obviously a key part of that, but it should only be one of several factors. Um, the strategic alignment with the, company, uh, with the publisher's objectives is, is also very important. Having a complete range of high quality services at the vendor also helps to possibly realize more volume savings if the vendor can be employed across many of the businesses at the publisher. Um, I'm thinking journals, books, uh, higher education, so on. Uh, technical capabilities at the vendor, of course, need to align with the, uh, the requirements of the publisher. Um, the history of partnership uh, so that the publisher knows that they can trust and have confidence in the leadership team at the, uh, at the vendor. Um, I've got a few other slides of avoiding pitfalls and I've added this uh, sort of a case study uh, box to, to each of them uh, with to indicate where things have gone well, so the text is in blue, and where things have gone badly and the text is in red. Um, so uh, in this case study, uh, in 2010, uh, we selected a new vendor uh, to receive 135 journals from Wiley's Chichester office. Um, and the theory was to set this up from scratch and reproduce uh, uh, an office at a vendor, which would be similar to what, what's done at Wiley. Um, and in this, uh, this case, the selection process went well. Uh, a vendor was selected with competitive pricing and a good strategic alignment with Wiley. <clears throat> so if, uh, a couple of slides on setup. Um, setup of the outsourcing office at the vendor. Uh, project management approach is advised, so developing plans and timelines, uh, a project team that comprises of um, individuals with different expertise um, that, that work well for, for us in our transitions. Um, standardizing of processes and standardizing of um, journal styles uh, is helpful prior to outsourcing, so it's a case of getting your house in order before uh, starting any transitions. Uh, I think that's a key point. Um, traditionally at Wiley, we don't, didn't have very standard workflows. And as we discussed earlier, uh, we had the merger between Wiley and Blackwell in 2007. Uh, of course, very different workflows. Even by 2010, we were um, still uh, making sure that those workflows were uh, standardized between the Two, two, two arms of the business. Um, and so that uh, needed to be considered during this transition as well. Um, now our workflows are much more standardized, but maybe our journal styles are not. And so of course we need uh, a detailed title specification uh, during, during the setup process. Um, systems uh, access, so for the vendor to um, access the publisher systems. We did consult with IT um, about what we needed to do. It didn't go so well. <laughs> we had IP uh, conflicts. Uh, the access was not to the extent that a, p a production editor would need. Um, they had sort of partial access to some of our systems. 
So uh, I think we could have done with uh, having more consultation, more discussion in detail about the requirements and testing before we went ahead. Um, and that's what we needed to do in order to resolve the problem. Uh, defining the level of information security. So uh, the vendor is obviously going to need a lot of information about the journals uh, in order to uh, manage the journals, content manage the journals, but uh, they're not going to have access to the financials. So um, uh, it, the publisher needs, or the, uh, everybody in the publisher needs to know where the line is uh, and, and not crossing that line. In our case, uh, the vendor had access to our intranet, maybe too much, and so we need to uh, work with IT to revise the, uh, um, the, the uh, accounts, the vendor accounts, uh, to limit the, the access. Just a couple of other points about setup. Um, uh, recruitment. Uh, went well. We didn't get involved in interviews of the production editors, uh, but we did have a lot of information um, about the production editors when they were recruited by the vendor. Um, so the vendor sent the CVs to us, test results. Uh, we got a lot of information. We, we were able to um, provide comments on the folk that, who were being uh, recruited. <clears throat> and training went well. Uh, we. There were vendor trainers who were, who were trained in a Wiley office. Um, they then went back and trained their PEs with support of Wiley uh, using a whole uh, gamut of training materials which were prepared. Uh, and subsequently, these trainers, the vendor trainers, then sort of were integrated in the Wiley network, were involved in any meetings, uh, got any updates, um, and so we were confident that the vendor PEs were kept up to date. Next part of the process, handover of the journals. Uh, this, the, the pace of handover is a huge problem. Uh, we, we, uh, in 2010, we started off too fast. It, it did slow down, but uh, um, we need to have a pace where the vendor PEs can take on a journal, get used to it before getting receiving a whole load of other journals. Um, phase transition, if possible. Um, so pre-transition shadowing, especially on more sensitive journals, the publisher PE could copy the vendor PE in for a period of time so they get to, to know what's going on before the handover meeting where we'd go through the documentation on the journal. And then post-transition support where the Wiley PE would be available for any, uh, any queries. Um, but what went well in the 2010 case was having a, a representative from Wiley um, uh, in country um, there for the whole time of the uh, handovers and subsequent support. Um, so if any, any questions came up, you could um, address them really quickly and they didn't become part of the vendor workflow in a different way from we would, the way we would have uh, expected in the first place. And questions came up that we you know, had not considered when we were sort of uh, devising training materials and so on. Relationship management, so it's a, it's a partnership. Uh, the, the, each, the vendor and the publisher is reliant on each other for success. Um, as I said in the last slide, uh, having an embedded publisher contact, working with all the vendor staff, sort of get, getting to know all the vendor staff and uh, being accessible for, for questions uh, was really good. Uh, reciprocal manager visits, so that if a manager is, has regular email contact with an individual, at some point they would have met each other. So. Um, a key part is also the team leaders, because they are responsible for the performance management of the production editors. So having close communication between the, count the Wiley counterpart and the team leader, regular meetings um, and uh, regular correspondence between the two uh, really works well. Um, and 
you need to support that management structure at the vendor. So having uh, trust in, in the team leaders is, is, is a key point. Uh, encouraging brand loyalty is about um, providing some uh, marketing material so the vendor feels part of the publisher, um, which I think is helpful. Uh, social aspects, enjoying some local food, uh, making friends at the same time as uh, developing the publisher-vendor relationship uh, strikes me as a win-win. Uh, positive feedback in order to uh, reinforce good behaviours um, really helps. So one of the issues that came up <coughs> is uh, working with the rest of the business and one of the key relationships for our production editors is the relationship with the publishing man managers, so editorial staff. Um, normally editorial would be used to having a production editor sitting next to them, they can go around and, and uh, have a discussion immediately. Um, and developing that relationship with someone who's uh, remote on the other side of the world is more difficult. So us in content management were able to facilitate that, develop that relationship, uh, ensure the vendor PE sends early email introductions, you know, get, the, get the, that relationship going, um, helping with teleconferences, getting everybody together, uh, sharing vendor org charts, preferably with photos, so the editorial know who they're going to be corresponding with uh, for, from then on. That was all very helpful. Um, the communication lines between editorial and in-house content management uh, is also uh, very key in order to get feedback on any problems that come up. Um, and having a structured reporting process um, and also post-transition maybe a survey of the, uh, of, uh, the business to see how the, um, how the transition was received in-house. Oh, yep, okay, I'll, uh, almost there. We, um, one of the problems we had was a year or two afterwards, so we basically dropped the ball on this, and so uh, we needed to, to invest more capacity to ensure that there was this feedback process uh, from editorial. Communication uh, is one of the more sensitive aspects of outsourcing work, so it's important to ensure the expectations are clear about the level of email, the speed of responses, and the requirements for phone meetings. We did have a, some concerns about uh, e uh, email correspondence from some individuals, but there were some measures taken and uh, uh, we got back on track. That, that, that wasn't an ongoing problem. So managing uh, performance in terms of turnaround, uh, we do have self-monitoring from the vendor uh, and they report to us on aspects uh, of turnaround. But I think it's important for the publisher to have oversight of key points, key variables, so that, uh, you know, that they, they are able to keep tabs on how things are going and know immediately if there's anything up. On the quality side, that's a bit more tricky. You can't just generate a report uh, from your production workflow system and see how things are going in terms of turnaround. So it's key to have this feedback from the society, from the editors via editorial um, to, to, to know how things are going on the quality side. Of course, we have automatic validation through QA systems. An important point is this uh, single contact. In our, our case, it was the offshore manager again to collate feedback so that the publisher is not providing different messages to the vendor. Um, there's a, one single message, one single voice in terms of how things are going, uh, you know, what, what, what the main uh, points are. So uh, basically the point here is uh, that it's important to ensure capacity is retained to support, uh, monitor, and maintain the relationship with the, with the vendor, um, which had been an issue for us. Um, one of the most useful documents we prepared was uh, uh, an escalation document so that vendor PEs knew who to contact for different issues. So we have a one general escalation person uh, contact, but a list of queries if you've got a query about um, a copyright or a systems query or uh, an invoice query, 
you know, who to go to in each case, and that, and that made things go very much more smoothly. So, to conclude, uh, outsourcing can be problematic, um, and I agree it's not suitable in all circumstances, but there are measures that can be taken uh, to avoid the problems and to summarize the standardized workflows before transition, having an in-country support person, um, having well-paced transition schedule, and staying close to the vendor uh, with ongoing support um, and a means of monitoring uh, key, key variables. Thank you. Well, Gretch, thank you very much indeed. Thanks. Okay, questions for Jim. Yes, Tasha has a question here, and then James. Anybody would have thought that I prepared this earlier. Um, you've spoken about uh, offshoring the, the actual production editor role, which is, is a step further than many, many publishers have taken. Uh, the question that I've got, do you think there's a risk that we are de-skilling the industry in the UK by offshoring this role? You know, you, you mentioned that, that China's become less competitive recently with the strengthening yuan. Is this a, a risk that we're running, that we're going to reach a point of price parity with India and China and the Philippines, and we'll have to bring it back to the UK and not have the people available? Yes, I think that, that is a, there is a, a definite danger there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it depends how it's done. <laughs> and if we... Um, uh, increase the, the skill levels in particular areas in content management. Um, I think the content management will have different skills, basically. So content management is developing. Um, so we are losing some things, but we're developing in other areas. Um, definitely things are changing, and I think it yeah, depends how it's managed. We, um, in our case, we, we did lose some key people where we think, oh, that's going to cause us some problems. Um, and I think in those cases, yeah, you really need to think again that, uh, um, yeah, we, we need to sort of retain those key people. Is it true to say that the Hong Kong, uh, sorry, the Singapore people are suffering from this as well at the moment? And I know it is. So. Yes, yes, I, I, uh, I would say so. I mean, Singapore has now been priced out, so uh, things are so moving the staff, on. staff, I'm us. thinking about the Wiley staff there, seem very the, worried. Uh, the Wiley staff at Singapore, um, when things moved to Singapore, it, it was the more the, the processing tasks mm. which moved to Singapore, and those processing tasks are now moving on, yes, to, mm. to other locations as well. But it was less about the um, specialist tasks in Singapore. Hi, I'm James Walker, IOP Publishing. Um, apologies if I missed it, but can you say a bit more about the in-country um, rep or that's, that's at the vendor is, for example, does that person work directly for Wiley or for the vendor or could you, could you say a bit more about them please? Yeah, um, so uh, we started with, uh, with in 2010 with one offshore manager who was based at, at the vendor during the time of, any, of the transition, so for six months um, the Wiley person, yes that's right, yeah um, so being able to answer any questions. But now that's developed, that uh, we now have, this is how content management is developing. We now have several offshore managers based at different vendors. In some cases, they're based at the vendor. And in some cases, they're um, at a nearby country and can visit regularly. Um, uh, so it is something that we, we have developed uh, since that initial, uh, initial trial run. Any other? Oh, yes. Uh, Joe, could you, oh, you take that other one first? Yes, take that one, yes. And then there's a lady here. Hi, uh, Liz Martin from IP Publishing. Um, I was just interested, you talked or you, you mentioned um, feedback from editorial and from societies. I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit more about whether that was a long road to, to, a, to a positive point in terms of the feedback you were getting. Yes, uh, I, I would say it was variable to start with. Um, in, when we started, we did try to engage editorial, say, look, there are going to be changes here. Um, uh, we need to work together to make, make it work. 
Um, and in some cases, uh, folk were very understanding. And in other cases, they just, it just didn't work for them. Um, and there were cases where you know, maybe the publishing manager were discussing the problems with external editors, and it was getting conflated. You know, it, was, it was really, uh, so uh, getting to them and talking to them, talking through the problems was, was a key point. Um, but then, of course, we, we later had the problem where we didn't have a structure for this. So having a structure to, to feed that information. So editorial feel comfortable about raising any, any problems they have, feeling like there's always somebody there that they can talk to if, if there is a, an issue that, that, that's come up. And, having, and raising it early, not sort of banking up all these problems uh, to, to boiling point and then, and then saying, well, no, we can't, we, 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 we can't deal with this. Raising them one by one so we have good examples, we can, we can address them. And, so we need capacity in, in content management to, to be able to support them. If, if I could add here, I've had experience with this system and it worked very well for my journals, but I did notice that you had to get on board the editorial assistants because they're actually the main contact with the editors. Yeah. And if they're not keen, if they think, see this as something nasty happening to a colleague who sits a few yards away, yeah. there's difficulty, isn't there? Is that right? Yeah, yeah no, okay. that's a good point. Yeah. Hi, I am Lisa McLaughlin from the American Institute of Physics, but I also worked for Blackwell for many years prior to the Wiley um, acquisition, and I was fairly involved with the Singapore office. But anyway, I had a couple of questions, actually. Um, on the point of communication, you talked a little bit about that, but at ARP, our, our production editors you know, have a fairly extensive you know, both via email and on the phone, communication with authors and with increasing submissions coming from China and elsewhere where you have an, a researcher who's not a native English speaker. So you, you know, two non-native English speakers, I'm just wondering how the whole communication loop really works. Um, and then at the beginning of your presentation, you talked about both production and editorial office services. So management of peer review, and I think you said that you outsource both of those roles. Um, so I was just interested in, you know, sort of what the, what the percentage of production versus editorial office is and if there are differences between those two aspects and those two roles. Yeah, yeah. Um, on the communication side, I think it's, it's, it's a key point where, um, uh, and it's also, uh, I think the main issue where a journal might be too sensitive to outsource, uh, if, if there's too many demands on the communication side, uh, maybe it's not suitable. I mean, we have, I work with our Germany office now, and one of the first things, what's, what's the language? What's the language that the editor speaks normally? Uh, are they used to talking in German? If so, it's not going to be suitable for them to, 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 to change their, their means of communication. Um, so that, that is an issue in terms of whether it is outsourced. But once it is outsourced, um, we do have situations where the vendor PE, yes, has to attend meetings with the editor, uh, teleconferences, so that, that's clear uh, that they will, they will do that. Um, it's not... Com yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's also a good point because we they felt, oh, a, a soft phone will do. Um, but no, we need a meeting room with, with, a, with a proper phone. Uh, so that's so some sort of understanding about the requirements there, both of the competence of the PE, but also the uh, facilities in the vendor office uh, are, are important to, to look into. Um, yeah, so the, uh, and when there were problems, uh, I think we did have some issues. And it, so those particular people that originally did have problems, the, the vendor PEs that did have problems, um, did develop. They just had to get used to the, to the, uh, the, the culture around the, the uh, co correspondence. And maybe they weren't too used to it to start with, but after some time, they, they, they did go on top of it. So it wasn't an ongoing problem, to be honest. On the peer review question, um, yeah, the slide I showed from the vendors was for all publishers from those vendors. So uh, I think there was peer review work that had come in to that vendor uh, from other publishers. Um, and yes, now uh, Wiley is doing something similar. Um, and I think the peer review 
uh, side of things, the admin on the peer review side has been easier. The vendors say that uh, there's less complications, um, like a, a peer review admin person could be promoted to a PE, you know, it wouldn't go the other way around. So uh, that, that's, it's, it's actually been easier to, to do that. I think we now, you wanted a question, didn't you? Yeah, go on, very quick. Apologies. You didn't wave your hand enough. <laughs> Hi Jim, I'm, I'm Janine from Emerald, but obviously I was at Wiley during this period. Um, you focused a little bit on, well, quite a lot on all of the problems, but I thought it might be useful if you just ran through a little bit very briefly for everyone in the selection criteria, because obviously there were problems with some of the journals, but one size doesn't fit all. And I think it's useful maybe if you could touch on how this worked quite well in some subject areas and not in others, or um, how it was okay. quite tightly controlled for societies and not own titles. Does that give you... Yeah, one, one minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yes, uh, most of the journals for, for, the, for that Chichester transition were widely owned and were s suitable for outsourcing. Uh, the society ones, we had to look at more carefully. What, would, uh, what was in the contract? What was uh, agreed? What were the expectations of the society? And so those were some of the key points. Um, and... Uh, some of those journals which were not suitable for this transition, yeah, moved to your office <laughs> at the time. Um, and yes, it did vary between subject areas as well. Um, some of the physical science and health science uh, journals, some of the key society journals uh, were, were deemed not appropriate for the, for the transition. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for the questions as well. Thank you for being thank so you. frank. Bye.